So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the, the Observatorio de la Lengua Española y las Culturas Hispánicas en los Estados Unidos. It is probably the first time many of you who are present here today have come to an, an event organized by, the, by this research center of the Instituto Cervantes at Harvard University. And I'm very gl glad that you have chosen to do so in an event that we, we've organized in collaboration with the uh, Embassy of Spain Education Office, and in which we have as our guest speaker a Spanish teacher who has recently received a very special award recognizing her excellence in language teaching, and who's come to talk about a controversial but very relevant topic for the mission of the, observa of the Observatorio, uh, how to use Spanish in the English as a Second Language uh, classroom to support emergent bilingual students. So before I introduce our guest speaker to you, let me thank Antonio Caballero, uh, Asesor de Educación de la Embajada de España para eh, no, Nueva Inglaterra, uh, for his efficient uh, uh, collaboration in organizing this event. So I'm very, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Marta Garcia to you all. She, Marta is an elementary school teacher, uh, currently working at Witchcraft Heights Elementary School in Salem, Massachusetts, and she specialized in uh, English as a second language and, and, and teaching in a multilingual uh, classroom. Marta uh, has a, a, a degree from the Universidad de Valladolid in, in Spain in, in English language and literature. And she also holds a master's degree in teaching English to speakers of other languages from Salem State University. She came to the US as a visiting, uh, as part of the visiting teachers program from Spain in 2006. May, probably some of you have, are here also within that program. And she has worked in, in Salem for 15 years as a teacher and as an advocate for the immigrant and multilingual community. Before coming to Salem, to Massachusetts, she had worked uh, both in Spain and in California for several years. Uh, Marta was awarded the Massachusetts Teacher of the Year 2022, and she's using that as a platform to amplify students' voices, as well as the voices of the immigrant and bilingual families who she knows very well, care very deeply about the education of their children. Before uh, I invite Marta to speak, let me tell you something about this award, because I'm sure she will not uh, boast about it. But I think it's important that we recognize how important that this award that Marta has received is. The Massachusetts Teacher of the Year program is the state's top award for educators, and each year, it recognizes excellence in teaching across the state by selecting a teacher who exemplifies the dedication, commitment, and positive contributions of educators statewide. Uh, Marta uh, is the first Salem, uh, you, you can come in. Marta was the first Salem teacher to become Massachusetts uh, Teacher of the Year, and she is the 60th recipient of this of this award. When she was given the award, the State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education said that, quote, as an immigrant parent of two bilingual children, Garcia understands some of the concerns uh, her new students' families might have. She reaches out to see how students are adjusting and to explain the school system, learning about each of her students' backgrounds. In her application, Marta said, and now I quote her, in my daily teaching, I try to help students nurture their identities and feel proud of their origins as they acquire new ways of seeing the world through a new culture and language. I consider myself the bridge on which my students can navigate opportunities coming from both sides without rejecting one or the other. And I'll just finish with two other quotes, one from the Salem superintendent, Stephen Zreich, who said, we are lucky to have strong educators in Salem, but Marta is a standout. She teaches multilingual learners in an extraordinary 
way that actively involves their families and empowers them to find their voice. And uh, I'll finish with this quotation, this time from the Elementary and Secondary Education Commissioner, Jeffrey Riley, who said, Ms. Garcia welcomes her students to school with an open heart, carefully chosen classroom materials, and a wealth of knowledge about teaching and about what it's like to be a multilingual learner. It is a pleasure to honor her with this award, uh, end of quote, and it is a pleasure to welcome Marta here today. I am, yeah, I am like moving, okay. Bueno, buenas, buenas tardes. Um, good evening, I think it is already. Um, it's, um, it's, going, it's going to be interesting because uh, this presentation um, is, has been introduced and advertised in English. I'm going to do it in English, but it's also um, a little contradictory that most of you are Spanish speakers and you are like from my, con my home country. So I, it feels a little strange to do this in English, but I'm going to, um, to go back and forth. So because that's how bilingual people operate, right? Especially in this country where, you know, our, um, our bilingual brains are mobilized um, depending on where we are and how, um, and um, how we are, um, um, expressing ourselves in which context and with what audience. Um, so, um, well, so this is my background, and um, as uh, as much as I don't like to talk about me, I think it makes sense to to tell a little bit of my story and and how I ended up um, maybe here in this place today. Um, I came uh, to the United States in 2006 uh, from Spain as part of the visiting teacher program. I came with my two daughters, my husband, who doesn't, who's not in the picture, but he was also there. Um, and so that's where all of this started. Um, I came, we came with the idea that our two, uh, two daughters who were born in Madrid and they were going already going to school in, in Madrid in, in all Spanish. Uh, felt like we wanted them to be exposed to English and become bilingual, and so they would have both, both languages, and, and we'll see what happens. The idea was to be here for the three years that the visa allowed, but then, um, you know, the, the rest is history. We're still here, and, and a lot of things happened. Um, so that is... Um, that was the, the original idea. Bilingualism was in our mind when we decided to... to to take this, this big jump in our life and, and move the whole family with two or three suitcases and start a new adventure. Um, I had been previously a visiting teacher from Spain in the 90s in Los Angeles, California, so I was already very familiar with the idea of bilingualism, languages in contact, immigration, students uh, living between the two worlds. Um, and so that was, that was also part of my background and one of the reasons why I, we decided to come back now as a family and, and bring the girls with us. Uh, so between 2016 and 2009, I was part, um, technically part of the program because that's, ex again, the three hours that the, the program was supposed to last. But then, as I say, things happen. We, we got adjusted, adjusted in Salem, the girls love school, I loved the job that I was doing and we decided to stay. Um, um, and so, that, but that is not as easy, as, easy as, as two bullet points on the PowerPoint because a lot has to happen, you know, uh, in order for us to stay here. A lot of learning, a lot of like certifications, MTELs, endorsements, all of those things that are required for us to continue teaching in the country, along with the parallel story of immigration, which is also a, um, a reality for us when we move from another place. Those three years are guaranteed, but after that, um, if, you need, if you want to continue, which was my case, um, I had to deal with, with that process of integration as well as the certifications and things um, to continue being um, uh, employed by my district. 
so then one of those requirements was to do a master's, a master's degree. In my case, was uh, in teaching English to students of other languages, which, uh, which I did at Salem State, my, the, the town where I, I lived and where I taught or, and where my daughters grew up. Um, so for all these years, from two, 2009 to two, 2023, where I I be, uh, which is right the present is right now. Uh, is I've been an ESL teacher in, in Salem, or ML teacher as we prefer to call it now. It's a teacher for multi multilingual students because ESL is a little bit too restrictive for what I do and the con context of my students. And so, uh, because I was demonstrated all the, demonstrating all this um, um, this this. Um, willingness to continue in the country to, to demonstrate that I wanted to be here and that I could, uh, com I, I, I could um, contribute to the community that I was serving. I did everything, everything possible. I was invited to participate in all kinds of task forces for dual language programming, um, um, curriculum development, uh, teaching Spanish to educators, all kinds of things. So that brought me to a place where someone saw my worth uh, and they nominated me for Teacher of the Year. That was the ESL director, the director of the multilingual um, department uh, in my district. I was nominated for Teacher of the Year and I became the Teacher of the Year, which has been a, a, an amazing uh, adventure. And to think that, you know, those two, two suitcases brought me where we are right now. Those are my two daughters now. Uh, and that was a, a picture taken on the day where the Teacher of the Year announcement was made public. Um, so yeah, I have a journey. I have, a, you know, an immigration story. And these are, you know, my students. And that's why I continue to do what I do after the years. and. And they keep me going, and the, the fact that I was given the platform to be Teacher of the Year has validated my beliefs in what I think should be done with multilingual um, students. So um, my, my popu the population that I serve are Spanish. I serve students who speak other languages, but the focus of this, of this um, talk today is about specifically the Spanish speakers, which are, by the way, the majority in my class. So they're mostly from the Dominican Republic. Um, they live in a, in a, in a community that, that has been established in, Sh in Salem for many, many generations. Um, so they, they live in a particular place, most of them, um, in downtown Salem. It's called the Punto, El Punto. It's, it's a beautiful place because it has been like um, um, beautified by beautiful murals. And I encourage everybody to visit Salem possibly not in October, and, wow. and, take, and go visit the, the Punto Urban Museum because it is amazing. It has uh, close to 100 murals, and they have a lot to say about the community that lives there. Um, and then I also have immigrants from Guatemala and Honduras. Uh, I love these kids because they come in a different they, they, their journey is very different. The students have been through a lot. Uh, many of them have crossed their countries in a taxi to be able to come to the US border and, um, and um, apply for asylum. And so these are their stories. And um, the Dominican kids, uh, the ones in the previous slide, um, come in, 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 they're immigrants too, and there's a lot of what goes on in their lives that has to do with separation and things like that. But these um, Central American students are very, very uh, special because their journey has been very difficult. Um, so a few, I'm not gonna be very technical, but I, I feel like everybody needs to know so, some of the terminology that I will be using during this talk. Um, so multilingual, multilingual learner is, is that a student that um, speaks more than one language or they speak Spanish and they're becoming emerging bilinguals because they will be placed in an English um, school setting, uh, 
hopefully a dual language setting, but most of the time is not the case. So multilingual learner is that student that is mobilizing more than one language um, in their daily lives and in their school lives as well. So we are moving into that, that definition now, that, that terminology, because it's more asset-based as opposed to language learner, which implies that they are here just to learn English. They don't bring anything else with them. Newcomer is that student who's new to the country. Um, a beginner is a student that has been maybe one or two years in, in the US. Intermediate is a student that is more proficient in, in the English language, but they still qualify for some English support by a specialist in, in that, in that um, instruction. Translanguage is that ability of multilingual individuals to mobilize all languages in their linguistic repertoire based on context. And this is the, the most, the sweetest, I hope you, I don't know if you see the card, but the card reads, and this was done last Tuesday, Valentine's Day. So my student is, is making, creating a Valentine's card for his mom. He's English dominant at this point. Everything he does is in English, but because the recipient of this card was his mom, and his mom does not speak English, he made a point to say, no, I want to write mamá y tu hijo. So how do I write that? He did not know how to write it in Spanish, but he knew that that's what he wanted to say. So it's, 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 it's the, the purpose of this particular combination of the two languages is because the audience was a special audience for him, and he mobilized Spanish for the purpose of the card. So uh, that's like the sweetest, sweetest example of translanguage that I have seen. Translanguage has many, many different modalities. Most people or more, many people think that it's a synonym of code switching, not necessarily. Code switching is one form of translanguage, which is when you mobilize the two languages in a sentence, okay? So it, it happens when the speaker alternates between two or more languages or language varieties in the context of a single situation or con conversation. So that happened today in my class. Two students, both bilingual, Spanish and English, pretty, pretty bilingual in the sense that they can navigate both languages, but there was a teacher in the conversation. There's, there's three people talking. One of these students was speaking in English to explain a situation that happened to him. And he was struggling a little with the language, but he was just making every effort to not use any Spanish. Everything was English, even if it was difficult. The moment the teacher was removed from the conversation because he had something to do, he immediately moved to Spanish because it was easier, in, because that student that was left in the conversation is also a Spanish speaker. So that was, again, another beautiful thing to see how that student being, being able to to accommodate for that teacher who does not speak, speak Spanish and he's speaking English, but then he chooses to mobilize Spanish because it's easier for him and also because the, the other student could speak Spanish. So that's another example of translanguage. Now, WIDA standards, access level, um, WIDA standards, is, uh, it's the, these are the standards for multilingual learners um, um, and they are, they have been designed by the WIDA Consortium, which is a consortium of 41 states that have adopted this model of teaching and assessment instruction for multilingual learners. Um, so there's a lot of technical um, things going on from, uh, from uh, so the, the four domains of, lang of language are always part of of the standards. So in a, in a lesson, if you're a multilingual teacher, you, mo you, um, you uh, you plan for a speaking, a listening, a reading, and a writing um, activity. All the four domains of language have to be present for that to be effective. And because our students are not only learning how to read and write in English, they are also uh, learning how to speak in a, in a school setting in the content areas. Because we know that they become very fluent very quickly in the social, um, in the social setting, but then it's more difficult to be able to talk about math or to talk about science or social studies. So the speaking and the listening are also very intentional, very, very intentional in the multilingual class. Um, 
So, so we use the access level, which is the assessment included in the WIDA uh, consortium, the WIDA uh, standards, the access levels give us an indication of where the student, uh, where, where the student is. The, the access level is a, a standardized test that is given in Massachusetts every year to all multilingual students, and it gives, an, gives us an indication of where students are in the four domains of language. Based on that, we place them in, 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 a, um, in a 45 minute um, a daily support of English, or in 90 minutes if they, um, if they are newcomers or beginners. So that, that access level is gonna give us um, a good, good data, not all the data about students on how they're going to be placed in, in, the, in, in the English, um, in the English uh, as a second language or a multilingual setting moving forward. Um, if you have any questions as I am speaking, I'm happy to clarify or, um, you know, or just respond to any comments that you may have. So what I do, there are many different models to serve multilingual students. The, the least restrictive is clearly the dual language because you're supporting both languages, English and Spanish, at the same time. And not only, so, and, and you're developing biliteracy, which is really important um, in the two languages. Uh, but that's not the case for many of our students. So many of our bilingual students are placed in general education classes and they have the support hopefully of a, of a certified ML teacher um, like myself for example. So what I do is a pull out model which is uh, their students are placed in regular educa general education classes with their peers, second, third, second grade, third grade, fourth grade and then I take them every day to my classroom where we do development of English in the way that I am about to explain. So why is the use of Spanish so crucial for the students in an English-only teaching setting? I always, I always felt like, what am I doing to these students who come from Honduras or the Dominican Republic with the most beautiful Spanish? And in a matter of maybe a year or two, they're losing that beautiful vocabulary in those, uh, that language. And I was part of that problem. I was the oppressor in that room just um, just putting English um, in, their, in their lives with uh, neglecting their Spanish, which to me is um, it's just not right. And it's, um, it's just anti-natural. I feel like a student losing a language is a language lost already, period. Because there's a lot that comes with a language. You know, it comes, identity comes with a language, culture, comes with a language and you lose that part of, of yourself as a child, you have lost relationship with your parent, with your grandparents most, most of the time and with a culture that you, that, you know, was your, your, uh, your native language, I mean your native culture. So, um, so it serves many purposes, the social emotional learners, learning aspect that I am describing, uh, social justice, and culturally responsive, like to use a student's assets, uh, linguistic assets in this case, is so crucial to develop a, a full identity of, of those students. Um, cognitively, we know that if you can mobilize two languages, you can make a lot of connections between languages. And I think it was Stephen Krashen who said that Spanish is a shortcut to English because there are many words that you transfer, grammatical structures that you transfer, so it serves many purposes. Parent engagement, obviously many parents are not proficient in English to be able to participate in the school life. So the communication with, with parents happens in Spanish. And also educating the greater school community about what it is to be bilingual, what it is to be a monolingual teacher serving bilingual students. That teacher, who has an English-only perspective is limiting those students' possibilities. And what I want to see is that in every classroom across the, this state and across the, the country, those students who are multilingual see that part of themselves seen, seen heard, honored, and that is not necessarily happening um, right now. So I have seen, like I said before, kids losing their language and it's the, the most difficult thing to see, knowing that 
my own daughters were a little bit in that situation if, if it wasn't because it was not that easy for them to acquire English and then we're okay, we're bilingual. We need to do a lot of work at home to be able to maintain that native language, which is to me something that could not happen you know, any other ways. But not everybody has the ability to maintain the language at home. Um, so that's where the professionals come into play. So this is um, Jose Medina. He provides dual language technical support across the country and internationally. He is incredible. He's bilingual himself, big, a big advo advocate of dual language education and the use of the native language, Spanish in particular, in any school setting. So, if, um, so let's listen to him. And it's just a minute, I think. I am often asked, Dr. Medina, what is one strategy, an easy way that every single teacher in any educational context can work to be more linguistically inclusive? And so here it goes. Ask the students that we serve, what are the languages that you mobilize? What are the languages that you speak here at home in your community? And then get an anchor chart and create that anchor chart alongside the students and place those languages. Do we language French, Arabic, Spanish, Mandarin, Korean? All of the languages that are languaged by those students go on that anchor chart that we are going to co-create alongside them. And once we have it there and we post it for the rest of the school year, we say out loud to the students, regardless of the language of instruction that we use in this classroom, you will always be able to leverage your entire linguistic repertoires and make connections to the language of your heart. Super simple, linguistically inclusive. Adios. So yes, and clearly there is no way as a multilingual teacher uh, that you, you know the languages of all your students, but you're mobilizing and, and honoring those and just by having them written on, an, on, a, on a poster for the year for them to realize that, okay, I speak um, Spanish, my teacher does not speak Spanish, but I know I am like making connections between those languages and it's okay to do that. Because I think we move from the, we are learning English, do not speak Spanish. Hopefully that is not happening anywhere. So I'm hoping that teachers more and more are, are embracing the bi bilingualism of these students um, without, without just, just being the oppressor once again of, of, that, of that ability that these students have. Um, many, many teachers feel very insecure because if they don't know the language, they don't know how to support them, but they're very simple ways that can be, can, can be um, you know, very effective, especially when you think about the emotional component of being able to participate in your language or mobilize the language. Um, so there are some examples here, full names, I'm going to explain what that means, and phonetic spelling of our names. I am often asked. No, no, okay. Here, so yes, so let's go back to identity, social, emotional, and learning. We don't need to buy a new, a new curriculum to teach social, social, emotional, and learning because we already have the tools when it comes to uh, bilingual students. If we're using and supporting their languages, that is already um, acting on their social, emotional, um, you know, well-being. Um, and uh, it's cult cultural responsive teaching. So uh, at the beginning of the year, I um, do a unit on identity and what it is, um, what, what our, in particular because we are sharing our names, we're saying I am, I am Nelly and I come from the Dominican Republic, I hablo español y hablo inglés, so we are sharing that as we are building our community um, and they are also in their homerooms having to explain how to pronounce their names some cases, in other cases, they see how their names are Americanized directly or shortened or, or put into nicknames. So that is already taking so much of their identity and, you know, on the first days of a school. So that happens. Um, so uh, in order to build that identity in my students when they come to my ESL class or ML class, um, we do a whole unit on identity. And I use a couple of, no, a couple more than, uh, but more than these two mentor texts, but always, um, I use always mentor te text to promote that conversation and to do like follow-up activities that will um, will um, have the you know the, their voices in them. So, Alma and how she got her name uh, is the story of a girl who who has a really long name. She's from I think Peru, 
and she has a long name and, and the name does not fit on her page and she's like, that, my, my name does not fit. But then that goes on to explain all the meaning of all the different eight names that she has in her full name. And then she, she hears the story of her family and her ancestors and, and what everybody did and who they were. And at the end of the story, she's like, yes, my, my name does fit because I feel like all of those names are part of me. So, and then name is a song is another, uh, another girl who, whose teacher does not know how to pronounce her name and makes faces and how you say it. And she's like frustrated frustrated and then mom says okay you teach her like your name is a song and it's these are just so beautiful these two books but so then that prompts like the activities that we do after where students write their full names and they may not know them but I look them up on their like the, their lists and and they realize okay I have four names my first name my middle name my mom's name, my dad's name, which is, you know, how we Hispanic people do things, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then in, in their daily lives, they become um, first name, last name, and everything else is erased. Um, so they write their full name, and they also, um, we, you know, it's part of, you know, of how, um, of a, a mini phonics lesson, we say, okay, how do you say your name? How you teach someone how, someone how to say your name with a phonetic spelling? And then we practice that. They respond to the reading in, in you know, different forms, uh, I mean, to the, to the books in different forms. And, and they also do like a little presentation because like we said, speaking is always part of our um, lessons because it needs to be um, treated as reading, as, as writing, and as, uh, like, as like the four domains of, of language. So here's Nelly, and she's going to tell us about her name. Hi, Nelly. Hi. What, do you, what are you holding? What's that in your hand? My name. Can you tell me more about your name? So when you take off these three, it spells my grandma's name, and this is my other grandma's name e. how, how about the other two names my la my dad's last name and my mom's last name mm -hmm. are you proud about your your full name yeah can you say your full name now loud and clear Ivonelli lidia martinez cabrera good job where are you from dr you were born in the dr or you were born here i was born here but i'm from dr but your family is from the DR, and you feel like you are from. When there. I was when I was a baby, my mom taught me how to speak Spanish. Mm. What is the one thing from the Dominican Republic that you like the most? Uh, papa fritas. Can you say that louder? Papa fritas. Who makes them? My dad. <gasps> he makes them when? Mm, when I visit. When you visit? Oh, you visit often? Yeah. When do you go? I go like uh, every day. Every day or every year? Every year. Every year. I think you go in the summer, right? I go on vacation to okay. DR. Excellent. What is the thing that you miss the most about the Dominican Republic? My dad and my family. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about a traditional food or a number of foods that you like from your country? Papa Fritas. Uh, Patelitos y arroz blanco con rabo. What do you wish everybody knew about the Dominican Republic? Mm -hmm. that is a how are people in the Dominican Republic? Spanish. They speak Spanish? Yes. But how are they? How do they treat each other? Are they kind? Sometimes. Are they fun? Yeah. Do they like to party? A lot. Do they like to, every day? Do they like to work hard too? Yeah. Yes, they work very hard. Okay. Um, so, what language do, do they speak in the Dominican Republic? Spanish. Spanish. Okay. Anything you want to say about your country or Salem? Uh, I want everyone to come to the R and vacation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bye, Nelly. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. So again, trans language happened here when she said. Uh, I asked in English, what is your favorite food? And she's like, papa fritas and uh, arroz con frijoles. So indirectly, her mind goes to Spanish because she's talking about 
something that she probably says in Spanish at home, and it brings her back to the Dominican Republic. So, again, so this is another good example of trans language, and it's okay. Like for those people who think that uh, that we need to keep them separated, that we need to be faithful to both, but when you are bilingual and you are in a, a bilingual context. Uh, that doesn't work that way. Um, so then another thing is the I am, I am from poem, um, which is just a simple poem of, about, about themselves. Um, so the idea is to say where you, your full name, where are you from, what is your favorite food, um, places in your, in your country of origin, and a, sen a phrase or something that you hear often at home. So then you start by saying, my name is, I am from those things, right? So, um, some, so again, this is about identity. I'm not gonna force my students to do this in English or, or in Spanish. I'm giving them the choice, clearly. Uh, especially if, they, if they're newcomers, they don't have English yet. So they, of course, were you know fan fantastic. They were able to do this activity on their first day of a school in an American school in their native language, and they were part of the community, and they were able to be su successful. So, um, and so this is another. So this is trans language. She's languaging in Spanish because that's all she has for now. Okay. Me llamo Guillermo González María. Soy de la República Dominicana. Soy del Locro de Camarones. Soy de Mata de Coco y Tornado. Soy de, de, soy de Giriani, no te muevas. Y me llamo Giriani González María. So, so another good example of the use of Spanish, even in an English-only context. Oh, sorry, I keep doing this. Okay, so another another big unit that I do with, with some of my older students is our, their immigration stories because that is a story that needs to be told. It has to be told because it, it's a journey that cannot be forgotten and it's a big part of who they are and how they're going to, to live in, in, in their country and there are a lot of consequences with, you know, uh, um, of, of this trip. So. Uh, again, we use a lot of um, text, mentor text that uh, shows the stories of other people who um, who are immigrants and different different. Uh, this is only two examples, but we read at least five or, or six different different stories of immigration. Um, some of them, mm, mm, the, the the one at the top is Mango, Abuela y Yo. You don't see the, the title, but you see Abuela is in Spanish. So no, Mango, Abuela, and I. Okay, so there's two versions. The, the version in English already has the word Abuela in Spanish too. So that's trans language is right there in their materials that we use. Um, so again, the, you know, that idea of like being, being uh, reflected in the materials that we use, um, and then they write they they write their own like the, it, it's it's a it's a long unit with a lot of different parts, but the end up uh, product is their immigration story, which um, one example is there. But the one that I want to focus on is I live with. So some of the ideas at the beginning are where you come from, wh when you came, why do you think you came, um, and then they they say who the, who they live with and who don't who they left behind, which it's a lot for them. It's, you know, it's a big part of who they are and some of the traumas that they have. So I live with my dad, aunt, primos, primas, my cute little baby, my mom, sister, abuela, and primos y primas live in my country of origin, the Dominican Republic. A lot of trans language again, okay? Um, and it's, it's, not, it's not done like randomly, it's not arbitrary, it's done with a purpose. Okay, like I am not going to analyze what went in that, but you may guess why she's using, she's making that choice, even though she knows the word grandma and cousins um, in English, but she made that choice, okay? Um, I'm going to keep moving. And again, like the importance of the instructional materials, uh, materials and, te and me mentor texts. So with language comes a culture. And if we are in an English only context, we hear a lot about the American culture, okay? And so my students don't feel represented in those books about someone living in a beautiful house in, with a backyard. My students live in apartments, 
okay? So those th stories about white people living a specific lives don't uh, really tell much, to, and, and they, they get an overload of those. So what I do is just I try to counter that narrative and I bring their stories or stories that they may feel like that, that belong to, to that part of their identity and their Spanish language. So uh, Abuela's Weave um, is about a, a Guatemalan story. So for my Central American students, um, uh, if Dominican were a color, beautiful one for my Dominican students. And then things in the middle, this is a Cuban folk tale, uh, two wings. Um, but it also incorporates a lot of language in Spanish. So the, my students performed uh, this story particularly. Um, they turned it into a script and they did a little reader's, reader's theater. They created their own characters, like you see, Don, Viente, Don Viento is a character in the story and it's, it's just Don Viento y Señora Agua. So for them to see those words um, in a text that is mainly in English and understand the, the culture behind, behind what's happening in the story, it's like the engagement, the joy, the wanting to participate and know more about the story and engage with the text in English and be able to perform to their native English peers. Uh, that was like incredible. And, and it was not very difficult to, to do because, because again, the text is so relevant to them, even though in this case it's a, it's a, it's a window. Uh, so the concept of mirror, mirrors are windows is that books, um, can be mirrors in which you see yourself or your identity. And windows are obviously um, uh, books that open you to another world, uh, to different worlds. So in this case, for some students, um, if I were Dominican, it's a huge mirror. For some of my Guatemalan students, my abuelas, abuelas weave is a big uh, mirror. But you know, if you think of you know, how they, they, the Dominicans saw the Guatemalan text, for them was a window, even though there's a Spanish embedded. So they're making a lot of con con connections about the different varieties of Spanish as well. I am from Spain, some are Dominicans, some are Guatemalans and Hondurans. So there's a lot of like metalinguistic stuff going on, even in Spanish itself with the different va variations of, of, you know, the vocabulary and all of these, um, these things. And, you know, and then the Cuban folktale was, in part a mirror, but it also in part a big window to a Cuban story that they had no, no knowledge of. So um, it's really, really important to pick texts that, that are relevant to their identity because they see a lot of windows in their lives. Um, that's a, at, at the top is a newcomer student barely reads or writes in any language. So what I do is I, I print those books in both languages. So he makes connections between, between the, 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 two, um, the two languages. Um, so that's about animals, I think animal ears. So he, he was able to make connections between a fox, y el zorro. And so he is starting to recognize the words in Spanish and then making the transition into English. So playing and having both texts at the same time in parallel, so important for, again, his emotional well-being and also because he's desperate to learn English. So I'm not gonna take that away from him as well. And this is about, yes, now this is about that whole metalinguistic cognitive stuff that goes on in the bilingual brain, which doesn't go on on the monolingual brain. And that's so crucial for our students to mobilize during math, during science, during social studies, and the content areas. So um, a lot can be done. And this is what I want the classroom teachers, the general education teachers to do with our students, because they, they it serves, a, many purposes, but one of, uh, one of them is that shortcut to English. So uh, vocabulary development. So if you know the word carnivoro, you already know carnivore. Cognates, no problem. Um, and then you also, if you break the word down, carni, carne, oh, meat. So I just, there's so much, so many connections that they make. So carni, even though it's an English word, it's an origin, it, uh, it's Latin rooted. So, and it's a Spanish at the same time. So they have like, in, in a sense, they have that, um, that 
quick access to language that maybe the English speakers don't because they don't know what carne means. Okay, so, so for our Spanish speakers to be able to make those connections and, and, and know that, that most of the academic language or the language of the, of the content areas are cognates from, from, you know, with the Spanish or Portuguese or French and the Latin languages. Um, so if we are learning the word strat strategy, we are writing a strategia. And if we're learning the word trait, we are also saying, okay, rasgo. Huh, is this a cognate? Not really, and you see how the student cross made a cross because that is not a cognate. So I need to really memorize both. But with the strategy, not so much. Res response, responder, pray, presa. So we do a lot of metalinguistic uh, exercises to say, is this a real cognate? Is it not? Does it look like? Is it close? Is it not close? And and so it's it, just that 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 meta -lang -lang linguistic exercise is so valuable for you know to to manipulate language and make sense of of, of both um, Spanish but also English. Um, so the vocabulary development, the, the vocab vocabulary development is a big, big, big part of my day because they need to build their vocabulary in English. But again, in the content areas, most of the vocabulary is known to them in their native language if they happen to have that vocabulary, which is another story. But um, you can always just bring it to the to you know to 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 their daily activities. So when we, I, and I say we because I co-teach with another teacher who is brilliant and does this very well as well, and she's a monolingual uh, teacher. Um, so the target uh, the target word is amount, and we do it in Engl in English and in Portuguese for those Portuguese speakers that we have. So amount, cantidad, uh, balance, equilibrio, equilibrio. Um, so this see their language and they know which one is Spanish and which one is Portuguese, which also brings that whole metalinguistic um, to, a, to a different level because now they are comparing yet with another language. So, And they get used to this and they do it in a very natural way. You could never do this with a monolingual student, okay? And that's what the teachers in their homerooms don't know still, that we need to just hopefully just bring to the table more and more. Um, yeah, so labeling in English and in Spanish. Um, again, I'm teaching them English. I'm not teaching them Spanish, but I'm bringing everything they bring or, or part of what they bring so they know that their languages are part of who we are. Um, um, this, or oh, this should be a video here, but. So yeah, so again, comparing languages, we read a book about Haiti, Dominican Republic, Haiti, geography, all of that. And then, uh, so some of the words were in Haitian Creole, some of them were in French, and they were very curious to know, oh, I wonder how you say, uh, how, how you say uh, the days of the week in English, in Spanish, in, in Haitian Creole. So I created a quick table, and they did like the most amazing, like. Um, observations about how they compare. These are third graders, okay? Um, so don't expect, but you know, I feel like there's a lot of like cross-linguistic understanding of how the, the world, the, you know, the different languages work in terms of like looking at the days of the week. So, and that, so I think French and Haitian are almost the same, only one of, or, only one or two letters vary, and the days of the week in English start with a capital letter and Haitian and French. Spanish start with a lowercase letter, and Spanish, French, Haitian start with the same letter, and the days of the week in English end with day, and Spanish, sábado, and domingo end with the word go, and the other words end with s. So I, for a third grader, I think that is brilliant. Um, and I had a video, but it looks like we don't have, the, oh, there is the video. So, um, so my students, because of the Teacher of the Year uh, things that happened, uh, the news came to my room pretty often, and they, um, and they, um, some some of my students were actually on the news explaining their journeys. Oh, I don't know what I just I did something here. I don't know if this video is available. Doesn't look like it. Okay, it's okay. 
Yeah, so, and now, uh, the, the, so this is what happens within the walls of my classroom. And this is what happens outside the walls of my classroom, which is how do we, re we reach out to our beautiful, amazing Spanish-speaking parents? Uh, how can we bring them into our school culture, which is a very American thing. Like, you come f we come from countries where uh, parent engagement is not a big thing. I mean, you're not expected to be in the school building like every month or every two weeks and for different activities and parent-teacher conferences. They don't know that. Um, so they need to be taught how to do that and invited. And for that, uh, we need to make language accessible for, for them, obviously. So in that, I, when we have open nights or uh, open uh, houses, as they call them here, um, so I include my students and I tell them, okay, tonight we have an open house. We're gonna write an invitation to our parents. We're gonna do, make them in Spanish and in English. And you're gonna show your mom the Spanish one, so she comes. And that brings a lot of parents because when the kids are invested and involved in the process, they're gonna bring their parents to the open night or the open house. So of course, in that case, um, if, you know, most of the thing, especially if the open houses are especi especially or specifically the, the designed for our multilingual parents, there's a big production of translating everything, of having them sign up for ESL classes for um, all kinds of things. You need books in Spanish, write your name and we will get them to you. So uh, a lot goes, you know, that with parents, obviously, and, and the Spanish language. Um, and I, I like to include the children because, I, like I say, that's what bring these really proud parents who basically come to this country for their children's education. And that is a misconception that many people on the other side think that they don't care about, about school because they don't show up for parent conferences. They don't know that that's even a thing. They need to be, you know, like e e explain what things, how things work in this country because uh, there's a common belief that what happens here happens everywhere and that is not true. So there's a lot of teaching and learning that has to happen, you know, both on the, on the side of the Spanish families who don't know that they are invited in the school community and also on the administration that thinks that by default they're gonna show up. So the Spanish, um, the, the including students in, in, in the process is important and there's a few examples of, of how, uh, you know, Spanish is including in conversation with parents. We did a little, um, uh, fundraiser to save the polar bears because we were learning about ice melting and climate change and how the polar bears and they felt like really terrible and they wanted to do something so we came up with a quick uh, note that they brought home which res which which prompted uh, the the cutest response from from a parent saying so we were asking maybe a penny or two it was symbolic because it was during the pandemic and the last thing I wanted to do is ask my immigrant parents my to bring money, I did not want that, but just one penny. And so this mom, the morning, in the morning after we send the letter says, Buenos dias, Miss Garcia, Madrid estaba triste por lo de la ayuda a los osos polares, no tenía en casa efectivo, solo en mi tarjeta, y no recordé que era hoy, uh, uh, si le podría llevarlos después, sería bueno. So she's apologizing for not bringing money for the polar bears. That means that that student was so invested in this project, a uh, mom, felt so bad about it and of course I responded do not worry we are okay we have the money it was just symbolic but for the kids to be somehow invested in this little project um, and then you know we usually I send letters about what the themes were we're learning in themat thematic units because it makes so much sense for language development uh, so we're learning about plants or about climate change or about um, immigration so we explain um, what, to our parents in Spanish what we're learning and that they could um, uh, review the words, the vocabulary words, which we also send um, in English and in Spanish and we, and, uh, like we already know, are cognate. So, a lot the, so parents learn, learn some of those words in English as well. So it goes both ways. So a lot of collaboration happens when you use their native language clearly. And when you use authentic translation of the language, 
like all these machine translation things that schools use to communicate with their parents don't have the same effect as the actual communication one-on-one -on -one between a teacher and a parent or with the intervention or, or with the participation of the, of the students. Um, another initiative to, to kind of bring Spanish outside of those really small walls that I have that I can only do so much is to uh, to teach a monolingual, monolingual English teachers um, a little bit of Spanish, the fundamentals of Spanish. So when you have when they have a Spanish students in their room, they can put the labels of the parts in the classroom in both English and Spanish or in Spanish. So the kids recognize many will recognize their language outside, like on the on the walls in the classroom. Um, so, um, so we did a whole program in my district. I was part of that, and we did a lot with like the vocabulary of the of the school life and the basics of how to communicate with parents. Basics, and then you know, uh, because the whole purpose is just to to start doing something. But what we don't want to do is just to th for for uh, for these teachers to use very limited in, uh, very limited Spanish and not be able to really get the message across. So, you know, uh, like um, the, the idea is to break the ice so they start using a little bit of Spanish, but then the meat of the conversations has to be via uh, interpreters. So that I wanted to make re really clear. So, but they learned the, the days of the week, the months in Spanish, and they were confronted with that situation where you don't know what's going on because you don't understand the teachers. So we conducted the whole pro uh, program in Spanish. And so there was fear in those faces. And so our message was, okay, that's your student eight hours a day, eight hours a day, 80, 180 days a year. So we wanted to, see, to also send that message that it's not easy to learn a, a second language that it takes time and it takes a lot of uh, patience and, and, and patience on the part of, of the person that is providing you know, that instruction. Because sometimes they feel like they don't, they don't learn English fast enough or uh, they should be in a different place right now. So this was a great opportunity for some of those teachers to see what it is to be in a classroom. And that class was for 30 minutes, uh, no, uh, about an hour. And, and they had a headache towards the end. So, uh, so it was just an introduction into what, into the Spanish language and the importance of reaching out to parents in, the, in their native languages and, and incorporate a little bit of their, of their students' native language in their daily uh, routines and lives and communications with parents. And um, another in, uh, other initiatives like outside of those walls that I was talking about is the, the seal of biliteracy that has been adopted in many districts in Massachusetts where um, high school students can demonstrate uh, the ability to read and write in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in another language other than English. Uh, and they get that seal of uh, biliteracy that will be put on their diploma and they will open hopefully a lot of doors for those bilingual students. I have to say that these students uh, take the test in their native language wi without, having, without having had the, the direct in instruction in Spanish because they are in, in their native language because they are in an English only setting. So the, their ability to pass that test in Spanish in reading and in writing um, it's because they're special people, because there was no instruction given to them in those languages. Uh, in, in the case in Salem, for example, those, these students, that's Claudia, by the way, and that's Jimena at the top, um, they, they, never, they never went to school in Spanish. Their teachers didn't even know that they spoke Spanish. And for a parent to feel that way, so that's why I made those connections. This cannot happen to my students because I have a certain level of privilege and I can do things in my house, but not everybody can do that or feel the need to respect the native language because that another big misconception of many of our parents is that they don't, we cannot speak Spanish anymore. That we need to need to speak English because it, because Spanish is going to 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 prevent our, our child or our, um, you know, our children from, you know, from, from, from school life and from, from, uh, 
from acquiring English. So they feel like, no, we're not speaking Spanish anymore. And that is a big mistake again. So that's another big uh, job that we have to teach our parents and to tell them that your native language <coughs> is sacred and no one is gonna move that. But you're gonna have to, to do your job at home because at school, that's not likely unless you're in a dual language program. Um, and I think that's it. Um, this is my beautiful Lucy from the Dominican Republic, Governor uh, Baker, when uh, we had the ceremony for the Teacher of the Year. I love this picture because it, it tells a thousand words. So, uh, yeah, immigrant girl, black student meeting the power of Massachusetts. So, uh, that was, yeah, this, this sums up my, my story here. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Questions, comments? presenting this, uh, your experience or your knowledge, your, your, your resources, um, the context so clearly and, and so generously, because there's, we can feel there's loads of work, hard work bef behind, behind all those attractive and fascinating mm -hmm. uh, materials that you've uh, described for us. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, it's, it means a lot to be able to share my story and more than anything, my, student, my okay. students' work and stories and how beautiful they are. Thank yeah. you. So would anybody like to ask a question? You can ask in either English or Spanish. This is a bilingual context. Yeah, well. you can translanguage too, so remember. Would anybody like to <laughs> ask or comment or, you know, or share? I would like to say that yeah. comment. Thank you. Yes. Um, I would try to listen in English. When I, last year when I was, well, no, I started to up, be ready to, to apply to the program, I'm, I saw your discu discourse about uh, the teacher of the year, oh. about your accent is your power. And mm, <laughs> mm. they give me um, strong or power to me to, to be strong to apply <laughs> for yeah. the program because no, it's not easy. I and uh, thank you because I'm here probably. Was that a, oh, thank you. Know oh, me gusta um, haber tenido esa influencia en alguien, claro ¿sí? que sí. sí. <laughs> <laughs> Nunca yeah. se sabe, pues. See. Yeah, no, it's 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 hard. Like uh, to to be to do this in a second language, you know, that whole idea of the affective filter and how the pressure of the moment and how your language doesn't come easily. Uh, it's a lot for 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 us adults, but it's also a lot for children. So that's that's um, that's I think in part why it was chosen because I represent that population. Um, and, and the struggles and the and the hope that there is in in the journeys and the uh, you know and the willingness to just make it in this country. Oh, <laughs> gracias. I have a question myself. Uh, what is the reaction or the response of monolingual English learners to their peer, their Hispanic? peers use of translanguage in the cla in the English language classroom do they accept that easily do they complain because they don't understand spanish no they're pretty accept what is the how do you deal how do you manage that? i've been in different contexts at different three different schools in salem um, and the two first schools that i was uh, um, working at uh, was a big majority of multilingual students so the culture was already about different cultures we hear spanish all the time and that's okay and many children like pick up a lot of language from their peers because they have no bias they are like i want to learn whatever the student is talking about i want to say it too so but in the last school that i have been like was transferred um it was a, a, pro, pro, a mostly um, white big white community um, established there for generations, like very Salem people, white people, very, very um, passionate about their traditions. And then suddenly, because of restruct restructuring in the district, I and a group of other ML teachers, multilingual teachers, came with a hundred multilingual learners. That was very, very interesting because at first, uh, even parents were like, we don't know what these kids are saying. We don't know if um, 
if our children are exposed to what? And I have to say that the parents tend to be the problem, that the children are more accepting in general, especially in the, in the lower grades. I had newcomers coming from the Dominican Republic having friends the first week, um, like modern English, English speakers. And my question was, how do they communicate? Because one didn't speak any word of English and the other one didn't speak. So, uh, you know, friendship happens and children are children free of biases and they seem to accept and learn from each other. So in general, the problem relies more with the, with the grown-ups and the teachers thinking, are they talking about me? Which is not happening so much anymore, but it is happening. The minute two students are speaking in another language or in Spanish, I don't know what they're saying. I think they're speaking about me. I think those students have many more things to speak about than about you. Because that comes with that fear of what you don't know and, and that fear of not having the full control of your class. But in general, the students are very, very accepting. And with time, those students in this new school that I am working at, um, are, you know, they, they, are, they are friends, they, I, don't, I don't see any problem. And many are very curious about what happens in my classroom because when I go into the classrooms and they see me coming and they get up right away and they join me and then we do all these things that we have seen. And the other kids are very curious because my students like jump out of the desk to go um, to my class. And so I have invited some of them and they like it. Yeah. Uh, hi. I Hi, Marta. Hola. I have a, minute, a, a quick question, but first, the work you do is stunning. It's <laughs> so deeply moving. And I've known Marta for a long while, but it's the first time that I have the pleasure of listening to her talk at length about the amazing work she does with the students. The question I have, actually, you were mentioning at the very beginning the WIDA standards uh, for, I mean, the 41 states that are part of this consortium, we share standards on how to educate a Spanish speakers in the classroom. Of course, because I love coming up with lists of shame, I began to look at the nine states that do not have those standards. And some of them, I mean, you have Arkansas, you have uh, but two that caught my attention, California and New York. I mean, which have large population of Spanish speakers, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Spanish speaking students from immigrant families. So I wonder if you know how do the educational systems in the states that are not part of WIDA, how do they deal with this particular challenge? And I know that you were, when you went in Washington with the other teachers of the year from other states. You got a chance to talk as well with teachers from those areas, so. Yeah, um, so I, I, don't, I don't know exactly, but I know California has a big, a big tradition of bilingual education. So I am guessing they have their own, their own framework that they follow. And I, I, I also think that New York may be in the same situation. So WIDA is relatively uh, recent. So the states that didn't really have a framework to teach multilingual students adopted this, this framework, which was originated in the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, and it's, it's amazing and it's incredible because it's teaching English to multilingual students of any language, um, really, not just Spanish speakers. And it's very well designed with, with all the cultural components and the linguistic components. But again, yes, I think that California has their own set of like, um, things that they 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 use for for their instruction California has a lot of bilingual programs dual language programs so they don't necessarily need to be included in the WIDA uh, because the WIDA is more for students who are in English only um, English only instruction set settings in case anyone is curious the states are Arkansas Arizona California Connecticut Can uh, Louisiana New York, Ohio, and Oregon. So I am, yeah, I'm thinking they may have their own frameworks uh, because there's multilingual students, in, you know, um, virtually uh, all over the and and the conversation. I didn't really have a lot of those conversations because some of those teachers of the year were not necessarily in the multilingual world. They were uh, science teachers or social science teachers or art teachers. So. Um, so it was more about the general education status of our, you know, in, in this nation right now and what it is to be a teacher um, 
that more, but I did have a good talks with the California Teacher of the Year, and she was in a dual language program, and, and I feel like they have their own standards and their own framework there, yeah. Hi, so uh, I'm already thinking of next year, I'm going back to Spain, and my question is, could you still see the use of Spanish um, as a great advantage in a bilingual school, but in a Spanish-speaking context, like in a Spanish-speaking country? You know what I mean? Yes, so yeah. you go back to Spain and they, you will have to do this in, in Morocco, in, um, yeah. in Arabic. You will have to do this in um, Ukrainian um, and in all the languages spoken to the many, many immigrants. Uh, I, I am very, very curious uh, to know how it is done in Spain, given the, the amount of immigration that has come like in the, in the last 10 years. Um, so I, I want to know whether those students are directly immersed in Spanish, forget your languages, or how that is done. Because you know the United States have a law, has a lot uh, history of uh, immig uh, of immigration, and and therefore they have to to figure out how to serve those students that come from all over the world, uh, and they have a lot of experience, and there has been like back and forth, and now we do dual language, and now we don't do dual language because so it's a lot of like pendulum moving between different you know ideologies, and it also has. Um, you know, has connections with the political, you know, uh, situations of the different states. And uh, so I know in Massachusetts, um, the dual language was like eradicated because some, someone decided to bring a proposition to say, let's just teach everybody English. Let's forget about all these other crazy things. And now with the Look Act, which was passed maybe five years ago, um, now dual language is, is, is coming back uh, and, and more and more dual language programs are being created, which is what my dream would be. If I had a magic wand, I would put all of our multilingual children in dual language programs because then, it, like, then you don't have to do this and figure out how in an English only setting I can bring their language because it, they would be covered, you know? If I'm not mistaken, I think you were, you were asking whether the use of Spanish oh, yeah, would be useful in a Spanish context. Yeah. Because, and I think you're asking probably because there was this rejection to the use of the mother language yeah, uh, in communicative approaches. So I think she meant, you go back to Spain and yeah. you teach English there. Oh, yeah. oh. And the, and the oh, environment, no, no. Oh, the environment no, no, is no. Oh, Spanish um, dominant. Perdón, yeah. would, would the use of Spanish yeah. still be useful, still oh, be recommended? That's different. That's a foreign language. We're not teaching a foreign language here. We're teaching bilingual students. Mm. We're not teaching a language, we're teaching students. And we need to bring their identities and what they bring. And we want to, for, like I, I want my students to learn English like, everybody else and be brilliant in English. But what I need to do is I, I need to bring what they, I mean, uh, to uh, accept what they bring, not only accept, but, by, but honor, because it's more than just learning a language, it's about a, a, a bicultural identity that they're building. So that would be foreign, you know, teaching English as a foreign language. I don't think that would work the same way. I am not an expert in that, I mean, I don't know. But I feel like in that case, you teach English, you teach English, because it's a foreign language. I don't know. I also know, you know, that, of course. And again, you, those students also bring a language, you know? But it's not so much about identity anymore. But yes, you can make use of cognates, yes. Or grammatical structure that are, uh, structures that are paralleled. Or grammatical structures that are like, okay, if I say, El ar arbol verde está en el campo. In English, I'm going to say the green tree is on the, you know. So, so that that so, but you can compare. I mean, comparing languages is just so good for the brain too, mm -hmm. you know. But but the, but the whole thing uh, here is about identity and cultural and social emotional learning mm -hmm. and social justice mm -hmm. more than mm -hmm. the language itself. We're teaching students. That's why WIDA moved from we're teaching ESL to we are teaching mm -hmm. multilingual students. Mm -hmm. And that takes many different forms. Yeah. If I can contribute to my own humble opinion, I think that 
recognizing that the context is completely different because as you were saying here, you're teaching bilingual students in a bilingual environment, in a purely bilingual environment. I think even in a context in which Spanish predominates, I think Spanish would still, Spanish or the native, uh, the student's uh, native language is still very useful in learning a foreign language. And I think we should leave behind the, that the rejection <coughs> Uh, established by the communicative approaches approaches towards the using the, 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 the yeah the, the exactly native and they're language. they're bilingual no mm -hmm. matter where they are so mm -hmm. they're gonna they're gonna mobilize those languages yeah. no matter what no matter what the teacher does you are mm -hmm. mobilizing your languages you see gracias and um, I don't know in this case I don't know there is but you know it's the end of the of the thing if you don't know Spanish let's say you see gracias and you don't really know what that means, but it's the end of the presentation and it looks like it could be thank you, right? So you're mobilizing what you already have to make meaning, you know? Uh, so you are who you are no matter what. Um, so yeah, mobilizing that language is, is independent of what the teacher or the instructor of, that, of whatever language is doing, you are is still doing that. But in my case, I want to bring that uh, and, and make it explicit for all the reasons that I explained. Any questions? Yeah. I think it's so important to think of what's lost when we try to make a whole education on just one language and try to impose a language. Um, I was wondering if, like, what sort of um, structural support you have from the school and from the school system. Um, because it seems like you're putting a lot of pressure as a teacher on yourself as well, like thinking of the parents, thinking of the students, thinking of other teachers as well. So what sort of background support do you find in, in the system? Okay, um, so I have the support of my um, multilingual department, which is very, uh, very, um, which, whose mission is the, the bilingualism and cult, multiculturalism, and and they have embraced. I am part. I am a product of that uh, of that um, department and 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 the the philosophy that lies be, before. Like so, th these things that I do is because I have been given permission in a way to do this. There was a time at the beginning when I avoided to speak Spanish with my native Spanish speakers in my class because I felt like my job was to teach them English and I was going to get in trouble for using Spanish. And I would do it instinctively if I want to ask a friend how is he doing, if I see he's coming in my class not feeling well, I'm not going to say how are you doing if he's a newcomer because my job is to teach English. I'm going to say, ¿Qué te pasa? ¿Cómo estás? ¿Qué puedo hacer contigo? So there is the whole emotional thing. I'm going to forget I am an English teacher. I am going to say I am a human being and I can communicate with this person. So regardless of what my job was, but with time, those intuitions that told me I can, I can mobilize the both languages because I am doing that as a bilingual person. Why not my students? So I became more and more like confident that I could do that. And I was always um, supported by my supervisors and um, not everybody does it because not everybody is bilingual. So for me, it is really easy to manipulate the two languages and mobilize the two languages because I can write them, speak them. So it's easy for me to do that. For someone who's a monolingual teacher, it, it takes you know more time and more resources and more. But like to me, it's so natural. Uh, so I became more and more confident, you know, to do these things. And now I am like just full force because now I have a platform. Um, someone said that what I was doing was okay and I could tell the world that that was okay. So now I feel really, really confident. Um, in the context of my school, now everybody's very, very, very worried about learning loss from the pandemic, okay? And now they're reading two grades before, I mean, below grade level, and then we need to accelerate their English. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's when, okay, what is Marta doing in her class that is not helping the purpose of passing the MCAS, which is the standardized testing for English, which has repercussions in how schools are funded, how schools are maybe intervene if they don't show progress. So it, it goes a lot with, with those standardized tests, but I don't care. That's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to teach my students 
English, so under the WIDA standards and the access testing, which measures English proficiency. MCAS is something that I am not responsible with, I don't agree with, the way it's designed, the way it's implemented, and the way it is used uh, to penalize populations like my population, and the schools that contain these populations. Um, so then it's like, oh, Marta, you need to teach. So you have to teach them how to find main idea and details because they're gonna be asked that in, in MCAS in, in two weeks or in, in a month. It's not my job, uh, and I don't agree with. I, I know my students are always going to be in the red because the test is designed for a standard student with a certain culture, uh, a certain language, a certain mod, uh, background knowledge that doesn't fit my students, so I'm not gonna worry about that. I know they're gonna be always in the red, meaning they're not gonna perform well because they don't have the language yet. Once they have the language, that's a different story. They outperform the students, the monolingual students, because they're making all those connections. And they have the maturity to interact with text, you know? So, you know, a lot of support in my world and sometimes a little of backlash because I'm doing things that don't, um, don't, don't serve the purposes of the English dominant culture, but that's okay. I always said I was going to disrupt the status quo and that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Would anybody like to ask another question? I, would just <coughs> <coughs> um, <coughs> I will. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your wonderful work, your wonderful job as Teacher of the Year and visiting teacher from Spain. We have a great group of mm -hmm. teachers from Spain here, and you are an inspiration for them. You are a model, and we really appreciate that. Um, the only part that w is the, the main difference would be that we want our teachers to go back to Spain mm. and put into practice what they have done here. Mm -hmm. But if they want to stay here, they are, they are, we are happy for them as well. Just, I have just a very short question. Um, and that is that uh, we are now um, promoting the program. We are bringing new teachers. We are preparing for the new teachers that are coming. We already have more than 90 teachers here in Massachusetts. And what would you tell um, uh, educational administrator of a school district or uh, that a teacher from Spain would be a, a good ESL teacher because we have some of them that are teaching in dual language programs. We have great teachers here in Framingham and other places, but we are, the demand is more and more of ESL teachers. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, and there are a good example of, mm -hmm. of teachers that are teaching. So, so what would you tell an administrator that a that uh, teacher from Spain is going to make a difference in teaching by teaching ESL? Well, yeah, it just um, if, if, if those teachers, which they do have the English proficiency, which is needed to, to, to teach English clearly, but they bring that other aspect that is relating to you, because most of our students in the multilingual, uh, in, the, in everywhere are mostly Spanish, more and more Spanish speakers. Um, so that, that is going to, to, to um, that is going to allow those teachers to communicate with those students in these ways and to facilitate English and to, um, and to teach English using those assets that those students bring, not to mention the fact that we are like Spanish speakers who can just communicate with families constantly and that is something that they, they don't need to worry about translation, um, of like finding an interpreter, we are that, we are already that. So because most of our multilingual students who require MLC or ASL services, let's call it, call it that way, um, are Spanish speakers. There's a lot of things that happen that don't have necessarily to do with English. And again, like, like they're bilingual, they are able to mobilize that bilingual brain. And if for that purpose, we can say Spanish <coughs> is a shortcut to English because there's a lot of, um, and they can facilitate that easily, more easily than an English, a monolingual English teacher because they're going to build those connections between the languages. And that is, you know, that, go, that can go fast. If you build that, that system of like, okay, you see this word, okay, let's say it in, in English or that. I feel like I missed 
I missed. Oh, here. So they want to, to spell the word celebrate. Okay, that's a long word in English. And if you sound it out, it's not gonna go anywhere, okay? But if you know celebrar, which that student made an attempt because she's not literate in Spanish, but she's just trying. Then, see, celebrar arriba with the S, do you see that here? Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, okay, let's spell celebrar in Espanol, okay? And then she came up with celebrate because she knew that there is the root word that we borrow from Spanish and then they have the intuitions of the morphology on how to add it, what to add, what morpheme to add to make meaning to, to make it into Spanish. So they build those relationships between languages and they become like really experts at that. I had a student uh, from Brazil, I have to say she was brilliant in Portuguese. Her Portuguese word was incredible. And she, of course she could spell the word hibernate because it comes from Portuguese hibernar, which is another cognate with the Spanish. She was teaching how to spell hibernate to a native speaker because she knew it. It was like, I can do this. So, so if you really, really like incorporate those native languages and you have the people to make that transition quickly, then you, you the, and then you're serving a lot of like SEL purposes, social emotional identity representation that is so like uh, very like popular these days, like representation. When I talk to my students in Spanish, they say, you sound like my tia. <laughs> of course, because that's how we talk, even though we are like, you know, an ocean away, we still have a lot of cultural uh, things that connect us. And there's a lot of comparisons that we can make, a lot of his, his historical context that we can provide. And, and that, that an English, English monolingual, English typical American uh, teacher cannot do that. So I would say that. And you can say you have the, we might have the Massachusetts Teacher of the Year teaching English as a second language. So, so yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I can make the case, yes, clearly. Also, coming from Spain, there's a lot of humility that we need to invest in this, in this and come with, yes, with a lot of that would be my biggest, my biggest um, advice. Don't think that you are here to teach them everything. They have a lot to teach you about many things, okay? Not just the language. There's many, many different varieties of Spanish and we need to embrace them. We need to learn them. Uh, we need to make mistakes, have like crazy situations like the ones I have had with, with students from Mexico and Los Angeles, from Dominican Republic, where there's words that have like different meanings in different countries and then there's situations. And I said something that I should, so, but humility, because we come from Spain, but we're like very little, like on the other side, most of our kids are from this side, okay? And so embrace their languages, even their, the, the language they bring from home, which may not sound like the perfect Spanish, or oh, they speak the Spanish del campo. Yes, they do. And that is as beautiful as your Spanish from Valladolid, okay? So that message again, yes, please, because, Sometimes there's some entitlement coming from Spanish people to teach the Latin American kids and please, please, please. They have so much to teach you. And to, I mean, that's all I know is because of them, their families, their children, the way they live, their, their priorities in life, their hopes, their struggles, everything I've learned from them. And because I was a little bit like them, just a little bit like them, because I went through my own personal situation as an immigrant, I could relate and I used that privilege that I had to be part of the system to help them. And that's what I keep doing. And I, and I, oh yeah, that status quo is breaking under my feet every day. And my principal is not happy, but it's happening, okay? And the whole thing with anti-racist teaching and anti-bias teaching, there's a lot that goes with these multilingual students. And the, the, the thinking that they, they don't know English, they don't know anything. We need to start from zero. No, that is not true. That is not true. Well, I think this is a time where, when we have to give Marta a big <laughs> round of applause, not just because of the beautiful presentation that I think she gave today, but also because of that award and that brilliant, enthusiastic and important work that, that, that 
uh, uh, she does every day in, in her classrooms. Thank you very much, Marta. It's been fascinating. Gracias. Un placer. Un placer. Un placer.